we'll get started and uh, so you can go on with your evening and your day. Um, my name is Nancy Cooper and I'm uh, one of the field consultants at the Southern Ontario Library Service and welcome to First Nations Public Library Week. Uh, I'm going to share a screen just to show you what First Nations Public Library Week is. If I can find it. Here it is. Can you see it? Oh, yeah. Did you see it? Okay, great. Um, First Nations Public Library Week is at fnplsn.ca and we are celebrating all things First Nations Public Libraries and we have um, dozens and dozens and dozens of First Nations Public Libraries all over Ontario. Uh, we're one of the um, provinces with the most the biggest number of First Nations public libraries, but I really, really hope over the years we'll get lots more into the into the fold. We've had an, uh, we'll be having a really exciting week of programming. Uh, every day there'll be a different uh, activity and talk. Today we are celebrating the author, winning authors of the First Nation Communities Read Award in the children's and young adult adult categories, Clayton Gauthier and Drew Hayden Taylor. Welcome, fellas. Thank you very much. Um, we're going to be talking a little bit about uh, the future of Indigenous literature and storytelling. But what I'd love for both of you to do uh, just quickly is to introduce yourselves and tell us a little bit about your winning book. Clayton, would you like to start? Yep. Yeah. Uh... Grateful to be here to share with you, and and it's been an honor to have this book uh, that I that I wrote uh, being being honored. So um, it's really no words I can share how it feels. It's uh, powerful feelings for me. Uh, this is this is new to me. I'm, I I wouldn't say I'm a writer. Um, like my first children's book was The Salmon Run, and um, I did that in a, in a classroom, um, and I got offered to get it published, so um, that's, how, that's how it happened, and, and so once that got published, it motivated me to, to write another story, to write The Bear's Medicine, and, and then now, now The Bear's Medicine um, got recognized, I'm like, okay, uh, I guess I can write, I guess I am a writer, and so um, <laughs> it's motivating me to to, to write more and, and um, share more stories, and uh, I'm grateful to, to be a part of this. Uh, mm, miigwech. Uh, Drew, do you want to tell us a little bit about yourself and the book? <laughs> Uh, I'm from the Curve Lake First Nation, uh, number 35, just north of Peterborough. And my book is called uh, Chasing Painted Horses. And it's a story that's been with me for like 25 years. I originally wrote it for a um, collection of short stories I had published a long time ago called Fearless Warriors. But it was a story that stayed with me. It wouldn't, wouldn't let me go. It kept telling me there's more to the story than the, I don't know, eight or ten pages I gave it. So about a few years later, I wrote it as a one-act play for kids. And still it wasn't done. It wouldn't leave me alone. It kept saying, there's more to this story. There's more to this story. Dig deeper. So finally, about, uh, about five, six years ago, I sat down. I started working on the book, on the novelization of my original short story and one-act play. Uh, the original story was called Girl Who Loved Her Horses. Uh, but the novel turned into uh, Chasing Painted Horses. And essentially it's a story, takes place in two time periods, the 90s and now, where these four kids, uh, well, these three kids meet this one kid who draws an absolutely phenomenal horse on a wall, and they become enraptured by the horse and, and the Shadow Girl's talent, and they become integral in each other's life. And um, eventually at the end of the story, the girl sort of drives off with her parents and disappears and one of the kids as an adult in Toronto sees that same horse 
spray painted on a wall and has a chance to settle the mystery and goes off in search of the person who drew that painting. Mm. And I'm done. That's great. Do you know, I had to give my copy away before I got to the end. Get another copy. Um, so don't give me any oh, really? <laughs> Yeah. I have to go and buy another dozen copies. Christmas is coming. Exactly. Well, we're going to purchase at least 250 copies. So hopefully yes. I'll get, get one. That, that um, means I can get a turkey for Christmas. Yes, exactly. Or maybe a tofurkey, if you're lucky. <laughs> um, one of the uh, First Nation communities read is celebrate the very best in Indigenous literature. And every year we have over 50 of which there's a short list of five titles named. Um, so congratulations, guys. These are uh, some really amazing jurors. Uh, the juries are made up of First Nations librarians, and they look at the book through the eyes of a librarian. So how can I program this book? Um, can I read this to children? Can, will kids take it out? Will the young adults take it out? Will the old people take it out? Um, how, will I, can I do a book club with it? What, what about it is quintessentially Indigenous that I want to um, highlight in my library? So you both should be really, really uh, proud that uh, you've put this work of art out into the world and it's been recognized by um, such amazing librarians who do such great work with so little in their communities. Um, so one of the things we wanted to talk about today is the future of Indigenous storytelling. Um, Clayton and I were talking a little bit before we started about how we've really moved from stories written about us mm. to stories written by us. And we hopefully have more of a freedom now to write all of those stories, not just the one story about, you know, the struggle or the, the pain. We can talk about the, the humor, as you have done, Drew, um, and the how, you know, the mama bear teaches her kids about the world around them. Um, how have you noticed the change in Indigenous storytelling? And maybe I'll start with Clayton. Uh, I'm... Like when I was young, I, I wasn't around much, um, uh, I guess, children's books and indigenous writers, um, but uh, I was exposed to our, our um, legends, our stories on the land of uh, Estas and um, stories of the animals, the eagle and uh, the raven. So been been exposed to that and it really opened my eyes to to the truth and I, I truly feel our legends and our, our um, ancient stories are, are uh, true and they're true stories and um, I really that really motivates me to to write that's what motivated me to write the bear's medicine because it's true to me and the the bear teaches us many things and uh, we got to be mindful of those things. These animals teach us so much, and um, those those stories uh, motivated me to to share this story and um, open open that door for for more to come. And um, I'm so grateful, so grateful. And so um, the change of of stories. Uh, you know, I grew up with a lot of dark stories uh, within the family, within residential school. Um, there's a lot of uh, hardship that, that have that we've dealt with over here, and um, we're the we're the we're the shining light. We got to switch it around now. We got to start um, sharing the true beauty of of our people and and how we do things and how we see things. And uh, so I'm grateful for this time and age to be here. And uh, yeah. Great. Thank you. So Drew, you're a storyteller. Tell us how things have changed over the years. Well, I'm ancient. I'm a thousand years old. I was here when, when I think uh, things got started in the late 80s and 90s. And it's, it's been so interesting. Um, I'm, uh, 
there's a saying in the um, introduction to Dry Lips Out of Move to Campus Casing by Thompson High Hitway, where he talks about before the healing can take place, the poison must be exposed. And um, it makes logical sense because when an oppressed people get the chance to tell their story, chances are they're going to talk about being oppressed. So for those first 10 and 20 years of what I refer to as the contemporary native literary renaissance, almost all the stories coming out of the First Nations communities were dark, depressing, bleak, sad, and angry. It made, it made perfect sense. Um, <clears throat> And uh, for me, uh, like I, I landed right in the middle of that and I was seeing all these plays, reading all these novels and they essentially had three narratives involved in them. There were either historical narratives, victim narratives, or dealing with the byproducts of what I refer to as post-contact stress disorder. And um, I just sort of decided that wasn't my path. Uh, other writers were doing this so much better than I was. I didn't think I, I could go out and do that. And I found a different path. Uh, for me, it was um, through humor. An elder on the blood reserve in Alberta once told me that in his opinion, for native people, humor is the WD-40 of healing. And that stayed with me. I was more interested in healing than uh, showing the poison. Other people were doing that much better than I was. So for me, the big difference in the last 30 years or so has been the fact that we've gone from doing all these stories about, I don't know, the dysfunctional aspect of the First Nation communities to doing stories that are, are humorous or what's happening right now, genre fiction. There's this explosion of native science fiction. There are, Tom, uh, Tom King is writing murder mysteries. Uh, Kadriak Lindsay Dam published a collection of international, uh, international indigenous erotica. Um, uh, Daniel Heath Justice did a sword and sorcery book. Uh, so I find it really exciting that we're now getting above and beyond the um, exposing the poison and we're now beginning to sort of look at all the new and interesting ways we can tell our stories. We're, we're culturally appropriating so many different ways that dominant culture has of telling its stories. Well, don't forget you did Me Sexy, which I um, participated in. Although yes. that sounds a bit weird, me participating in that. I wrote something for Me Sexy. <laughs> Hang on, it's all in the phrasing. Yeah, um, those series of books, right? They're just sort of explorations of different aspects of uh, Indigenous culture. The first one was Nate, um, me funny about indigenous humor, which was bizarrely successful. Second one was me sexy, exploring indigenous sexuality. Third one was about our, how our heritage and our culture influences and encourages our artistic choices. And I have, I'm halfway through doing a fourth one now oh, called great. me tomorrow. Because we're so, as indigenous people, we're always looking what we lost, where we came from, what we're trying to get back. I want to turn that lens around and look at the future. Where will we be in 10, 20, 50 years from now? So I'm talking to a bunch of interesting people about their views. And this is not science fiction. These are essays on where Indigenous people will be or should be in the upcoming decades. Wow, that's exciting. Um, that, that helps us go on to our next, our next uh, topic of conversation around what needs to be in First Nations public libraries. Um, let's move to the children's section of the library. Clayton, what do you want to see in that area? Uh, you know, becoming a grandpa recently. As oh, really, congratulations. Uh, opened my eyes to the influence and the influence of books, the influence of um, writing, the influence of of art on our children and you know truly we're soft and individuals we're soft and loving individuals and um that was a part of the bear's medicine too i put the soft love into that and i feel our kids need to be around that a lot more um for me i didn't get that that love that i thought i deserved when i was young and so breaking those barriers and um, it all starts with us. And, and so 
what can, what can I do that's that's better for for my kids is be more loving and, and caring and um, sharing that love and and we can do that through books and through through all nations and uh, love love is a powerful gift that we have and I, I truly feel that's a that's a big um, that's a big part of our culture of our ways and uh, so I'm hoping to see more of that in, in books and in the children's books that are coming up and other artists uh, sharing the love in a good way and, and um, you know, for our kids, for our grandkids. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's awesome. Do you have any um, authors that you want to give a shout out to that have either influenced you or you see their work and you... Well, I, I wouldn't say any authors influenced me. It was more artists than, than anything. Um, for me, growing up, uh, I'm a really physical person. That's why I did a, a picture book, because I, I like to see things. I like to see and draw. And so um, there was artists I looked up to, like Victor Morris. He, he had a big influence on me. and. Peter George, he had a big influence on me. And I, I, when I wrote The Salmon Run, I was in school in the Analkin Center in, in the Okanagan and um, amazing, powerful artists there too. And it was a blessing to be a part of them and learning from the nations there too. And uh, they inspired me to, to write more. And uh, after this, this book came out, it's, it's inspiring to, to do more. So um, I feel as artists, we inspire each other. We, we need to lift each other up and, and keep sharing our gifts. And to the artists that are coming up to, uh, our kids are watching. Our kids are watching. So um, we've got to do what we can do while we're here. Yeah. yeah, that's great. Thank you very much. Do you have a copy of the of your book? Handy Clayton's, you can show the, the audience because uh, I had to give my book, a, my copy of yours away as well. Uh, just you before give all your books present. away, don't you? I know, I'm the book lady. Um, there yeah. it is. Okay. It may be kind of bright, but. There we go. I see it. So cute. So, I, it's really special to me because I'm Bear Clan and I have twins. So I loved it from the beginning. <laughs> Beautiful. <laughs> um, okay, so you have your finger on the pulse of Indigenous. Um, and you've, you've named all kinds of, of amazing authors. What does the library need to look like? Well, Someone's for me, I mean, I go back to my childhood. Children. What? I see somebody waving behind you. That's Janet. Oh my God. <laughs> um, no, I remember as a kid, I used to love hanging out at the school library in Lakefield where we, where everybody from my reserve went to school. And I used to just love it there. I would go in, I would just disappear into there. The doorway to that library was a portal to a thousand different stories. And I would spend my recesses in there, my lunch hours. I would go in as frequently as I could. My reserve didn't have a library. So for me, I mean, I just loved it, period. But the thing I think is really interesting is when I was young, I really didn't see me in a lot of those books. Um, I still enjoyed the stories. I still enjoyed this, that, and all these great adventures and the nonfiction. But I, wasn't, I didn't see a lot of stories about Native people in there. And um, those like... that I did written by white the very point of this award the very point of your organization is to is you know as as somebody who was once young who I wish I was young today I just would like to see m as much accurate representation in as many different kinds of stories as possible adventure stories detective stories all those different kind of things because you know um, when you're young you well, I can only speak for myself, but I hoovered up so many different stories I could find. Um, um, you know, I 
literature, um, adventure, horror, all these different things. It'd be nice to see um, Indigenous characters in those stories, as wide a variety as possible. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I think now that I'm a parent, it really is amazing the, the books that are in the kids where they can see themselves reflected. That's so amazing. Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. One funny story last year, uh, one of my guys was um, in class and this teacher was showing this book and they were talking about this uh, doctor who was also an actor and he was just this amazing person, you know, and mm, who could that puts, be? my kid puts up his hand and he said, that's my dad. <laughs> so great but that well, back, would have never happened for me or you right well, back back in the early 90s when i wrote my um funny you don't look like one series i would the the, the, the first volume was sold out it it, it appeared and I had one of these things where I had no idea if, it, if anybody would care about it. You know, my, my laments over being, uh, my, you know, the standard joke that I've been, had for over 20, 25 years. I'm half Ojibwe, half Caucasian, so technically that makes me an occasion, but um, a special occasion. <laughs> um, that came out in, in, in the book form of um, Funny You Don't Look Like One, and it was just hoovered up. And I had so many people actually fixate on the title funny you don't look like one because so many people of mixed blood had heard that term about them and they picked it up and it was a series of essays about being mixed blood and as i said i had not read anything of, of that nature when i was growing up and i approached it through humor so um so obviously there's an audience out there for looking at the indigenous experience from so many different ways well, thank goodness, because that one way was getting a little bit tedious. So I'm glad we have all kinds of other ways to uh, look at ourselves and and, ref and have ourselves reflected out there for our young people to see. It's amazing. Yeah. Um, and that, that brings me to the next topic. You guys are the best to interview. Oh, my goodness. Um, the concept of your art. So we look, looking behind Clayton, I see a lot of his art work, his actual, the work that he does with his hands and his heart as opposed to writing down words. Um, and Drew, your, your art is not just the written word, you do all kinds of documentaries. And um, I know that you annually travel to Germany to do a series of lectures um for the germans who love us by the way and i did not know is that true what you said about hitler actually loving indigenous people so much so that we were considered like honorary um, aryans honorary aryans that's right so he, he, made, he gave some is that true? edict in the in the 30s where he made uh, in north american indigenous people honorary aryans yes oh dear lord <laughs> So, you, so, so my kid to, hears that. Uh, the Third Reich, you're actually white. <laughs> Surprise! Um, anyways, so Clayton, um, what are some of the other kinds of art that you engage in? I know you were talking about carving earlier today. Yeah, um, I carve. Uh, I drum make drums. I'm a drum maker also. Um, I like to uh, paint also sing um, songs start coming to me too um, grateful for the songs and uh, the art gives me a chance to tell my story through through visual and the animals have many different teachings um, uh, you know the the salmon run and the bear's medicine is a start and there's so there's so many teachings on the land and I, I wanted to share that earlier too I'd like to see more of that in, within libraries and within books and um, different perspectives. And uh, so, um, yeah, the art is my heart and uh, I'm grateful to have it in my life. And uh, yeah. That's wonderful. Thank you. Did you make that drum that's behind you? Yes. Yeah. There's a couple. Oh, that's cool. There's one I got in front of me here. Beautiful. Um, 
drew. Wow. Oh my gosh. That's gorgeous. Stunning. Look at that. Rob. So this is a story in itself. And so I, I have a chance to share my story through art and uh, like with the book, it, within the pictures of the book, there's stories in the pictures too that I, that I explain when I um, have presentations and different things. So, yeah. That's so great. I hope that one day I'll be able to come and see your studio. Yeah, that'd be nice. We can travel again. Um, <laughs> Drew, what, what's going on? You're doing a documentary. What's it about? Oh, actually, it's a, it's a series. It's a documentary series for APTN called The Going Native. And it's just where we interview people, uh, um, wacky and fun Indigenous people, as well as profound and serious Indigenous people. Some of the new and interesting things that are happening in our communities, as well as some of the, um, the more traditional classic aspects of... Um, of our many different communities in Canada and the States. It's called Going Native and the first season uh, airs uh, in I think it's uh, January on APTN. So we just started season two before it's even aired. Oh, wow. So where were you, where are you, where were you yesterday? Well, actually we started shooting about five days ago and we started in Nipis Sing, North Bay, and then went to the Amati Birch Bark Canoe Maker, and then went to the uh, Canoe Museum in Peterborough and saw Kale Musgrave, who made, who shot and killed a duck, and showed us how to prepare it um, in the forest using just the stuff around us. Shoni filmmaker. Tomorrow we're going to Six Nations to talk to a motorcycle club and then a lacrosse team there. And then we're going to Aqua Cessna to talk with um, a, um, a race car driver there who's going to teach me how to, how to drive a race car. Um, the things I get myself into. Yeah, and you know that I think that's a really great way for us to wrap up our talk today when you're talking about all the ways that our people have themselves into society and are thriving and um, succeeding. So I'm capturing all of those things. Totally, totally. I mean, I'm, as a storyteller, I just spend my days looking for interesting stories. So great. Okay, fellows, I really want to, um, you know, hold my hands up and say chi miigwech for uh, your time today. I know that uh, Clayton, you had to take some time off work for this, so I really, really appreciate it. And Drew, I know you're um, always moving. You're kind of a moving target, so thank you for taking the time to speak with me and to help us all celebrate First Nations Public Library. Is week. that right um, now as we speak? This is uh, First Nations Public Library Week? It's this week, yeah. I'll have to tweet that out. Please do, yes. Yeah. So people can go to fnplw.olsn.ca to get the uh, info. You can download a poster, you can register for a link to the um, Facebook Live and the actual live uh, teachings that are going to happen. And um, people also get an opportunity to do some um, Zoom bingo. So that's very <laughs> exciting. What kind of Indigenous week would it be if there was no bingo? <laughs> Are you perpetuating cliches? <laughs> I just want to win something, man. <laughs> <laughs> Guys, miigwech, bama pi, have a great day, and thank you again on behalf of the uh, Ontario Library Services North and the thank you. Ontario it was, it was Library fun. Service. Okay, bye. Bye-bye. Bye, Clayton. See you.